Adrian Brennock has been up to his usual mischief. I went to attach a link for a Google Drive document of his MP3, one of his Voxes, <laughs> and I couldn't access it. Apparently some violation. And uh, so I checked out both of them and the same thing. I did, however, re-upload them without... Um, you know, putting in the swear words, I just shortened the um, name, re-uploaded them and re-uploaded the link to um, my Facebook page. I haven't updated the links on any of the vid videos on YouTube, uh, so uh, I don't know what I'm going to do at this stage. One thing I do know is that... Um, it is brought to mind how to deal with this issue that any links that are given out publicly are only to one set of documents that are on a Google Drive account. See, I've got quite a few different uh, Google accounts, quite a bit of free storage. So, um, And even like with YouTube, just uploading under a different name. Uh, it's because of the standard bot removal of the information. Uh, I think some of it may have disappeared from my Freedom Org as well. So to ensure that all this evidence is available to those authorities that are actually in possession <laughs> of the links and are currently either investigating it or about to investigate it, they will need access to all these documents and research so that it makes it a lot easier for them because uh, that way I don't have to give it to them. I can send them an email or whatever and just have a whole list of uh, Google Drive links. So uh, it doesn't matter how many times you get those links censored, Adrian Brunock. They're going to be up in places where you have no clue of. And if you want to complain to the relevant bodies, well, they're the ones that have actually got those links. So, yeah. Now, another quick update, too, is that there was illegal activity as far as earthworks going on at 3 triple two. You know how they like to do stuff without DA approval? Well, have no fear. The council got on to them at the end of the week last week and uh, dished them up some advice to stop everything they're doing. And uh, this all came at a time too when... Um, I'm hearing from several people in northern New South Wales that it's been pouring down with rain. And I look out in sunny old Tassie, there's not a cloud in the sky, and it's like, yeah, well, we'll probably get our bit, but it won't be as uh, radical as what you get in northern New South Wales. No, you've got uh, different radical extremes down here. Tell you what, uh, you know, when you watch the wind come in, the wind bring in those cold uh, raindrops sideways. Yeah, you don't mind getting rained on in the warm tropical, well, mid-tropical northern New South Wales. Actually, it's quite nice to stand in the rain when it's hot, isn't it? <laughs> cool down. And another update is the number of people that are now involved from all different avenues. Um, it's really actually a joy to behold to see how many people uh, are activating um, on their side to do with all of the information that's been provided to them. And so some, I'm pleased to report that some positive steps have been made towards bringing all of these people to a halt and to account. Now when it comes to when I first started investigating all the activities, it has been an evolution of finding out what is fact, what is fiction, what are half-truths, 
what things may be, could be, uh, what doesn't make sense, what makes sense, how things fit, and where everybody belongs in uh, what went on. And one of the things that I wanted to sort of explain more about was Adrian Brannock's bankruptcy. Because in previous videos, I have always put it in the terms of whilst under service of a bankruptcy notice and around the date of his final bankruptcy hearing. Now, his date of his final bankruptcy hearing was the um, 14th of August 2018. So that was nearly a month before his actual date of bankruptcy. Now, as with all things, it's a learning and evolving process. You know, nobody can know everything. And this is where I feel it good to share with others as I refine the details and understanding to update previous videos where my understanding was less and maybe a little bit off track. And that said and done, it's still not to say that uh, my way of understanding and interpreting this information is 100% correct either. So you can always look at documents and go on people's interpretation. But there are certain things that you can use to begin with. Like, what is the difference? What, there's two bankruptcy notices here. One's for Mark McMurtry's mate Rodney Colton and the other mate of his, oh, Adrian Brennock. But if you'll notice, there's uh, two di different types of bankruptcy. There's a debtor's petition and a sequestrian order. Now, a sequestrian order is pretty much when the court appoints you a trustee because your creditors have put forward that they, well, they want to bankrupt you. And so they've put forward an order to the court and the court has ordered that a trustee be appointed. So there you have a court appointed trustee. Now I'm explaining the differences because in Rodney's case over here on the left, he didn't have a choice in who his trustee is. Now if you go over here to Adrian Brennock, he's got a debtor's petition bankruptcy, which means that he put in a petition to go bankrupt and he had already picked out the liquid, uh, not liquidator, well he had two that, but he'd already picked out the person he wanted to be trustee of his bankruptcy. And like with when he did the same thing with the company, he went to Stephen Starts and then they proceeded from within Stephen Starts and Adrian Brannock working together to then be appointed, have Stephen Starts appointed liquidator or well um, appointed administrator first and then liquidator and then take it through to the court as pretty much the liquidator that Adrian Brannock picked. So he's picked his liquidator and he's also picked his bankruptcy trustee. Now someone like Adrian Brannock is going to go shopping for someone that will accommodate the kind of activities and behaviour that he participates in. Either someone who is willing to participate in it or someone who is, well, I'd find it hard to think that he'd think that a trustee could be so stupid and gullible, but to actually find someone that is dumb enough to get conned and not check into anything he does you know I, or someone that um, you may be able to find some dirt on and uh, control them that way 
I mean, some of the methods that I've seen employed by um, ah, the extremes you would not fathom. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> do I say it? Yes, I suppose I will. It is becoming uh, clearer to um, several people now that members that used to belong to the NICAP on Minjimbal community may actually be followed. And, uh, well, there is many accusations of threats, both um, to person and property, and also threats that have been carried out. They constantly participate in harassing through threatening legal action through lawyers and you know it, it's just an ongoing thing that they're constantly taking people to court to shut them down and they think that because they won a defamation case against Gillian Norman that they're actually exempt because they can go oh well, look at that judgment she was wrong this person's wrong end of story well, it's not that simple because, well, I've looked at everything that's been presented to the courts in the past and I can't find one whisper of Adrian Brannock's bankruptcy and the, the importance that it, that actually plays. So in looking at a little bit more at how Adrian Brannock became a bankrupt, so go back to the original Brisbane Registry hearing that was listed. And even when I first looked at this, I knew that there were parts missing, uh, parts that are not available for public viewing. And you can tell that simply because it says up here that the whole thing that was started was to set aside a bankruptcy notice. So, um, again, this is, I don't understand how, if this is a debtor's petition to go bankrupt, why he would apply to set aside the bankruptcy notice. But anyway, because what's not on here, now just hang on. Okay, so what's not on here is what's relating to this first order where it says here view orders. It says the time for compliance with the bankruptcy notice be extended to the 21st of August 2018. So there is in play a bankruptcy notice but nothing prior to this to indicate when uh, that was served. So the only thing we can go by is that because a bankruptcy notice had been served that it was set for a hearing on the 19th of June and on the 12th of June Adrian Brennock filed all these documents or well, except for the one on the 15th. So a week before his due to go into, well it's not court, it's the judges chambers. If you can see here, they were both heard in chambers. So a week before he's supposed to go to chambers to talk about his bankruptcy, he files two affidavits and a B2 form and then three days later files the necessary B4 form on the creditor, the Deputy Commissioner of Taxation. So he, um, hang on, I'll show you what a B2 is. All right, so this is the B2 form where uh, pretty much Adrian Brennock has filled out the B2 form. He's um, obviously filed a notice to get the bankruptcy set aside or the bankruptcy notice set aside. Now, as a requirement of filing this B2 form, he also has to file the form B4. 
which is notice of appearance. So he then has to file the notice of appearance on his creditor, the Department of Taxation. And like with most standard things, there has to be at least 28 days after date of service. Now when Adrian Brennock filed this application, he did so with his lawyer, Rose Litigation. And after already going to see his bankruptcy trustee and organising that he would be the trustee for the bankruptcy. So in this circumstance, Adrian Brennock chose who his trustee was. It was not a random chance of the court and you got what you were appointed. There was the opportunity to very carefully select what is a commonly known term as a friendly. You know, like they talk, uh, Mark Darwin talks about finding um, friendly notaries because some notaries actually have this crazy idea that they're actually verifying the information. And uh, in a way, that's exactly what they're doing. They're verifying that the information provided is correct. So, yeah, so I do know it's just like the same as finding, well, I suppose a JP is a notary, aren't they? <laughs> but, um, yes, there is a distinct difference between those that interpret, look, I'm here just to witness your signature, and those that actually understand that there is a certain amount of the person signing that is actually stating to the best of their ability, you are presenting the truth. And of course, if they don't know it or can't ascertain it, you're not going to get um, a lot of them to sign it. So in essence, all these documents here are in response to a bankruptcy notice that had been served on Adrian Brennock. And he put in affidavits and these forms to appear to set aside the bankruptcy notice. On the 14th of August, that application to set aside the bankruptcy notice was dismissed. And as, hang on, and a month later, a statement of affairs had been filed and his bankruptcy was entered on the National Personal Insolvency Index. So he's a registered bankrupt. He's an undischarged bankrupt. He went bankrupt on the 17th of September, 2017. Now, in between June and August, his final hearing date, there was so much activity going on because Adrian Brennock had directorships and shares and he had his main company, company Nepi, all in his name. So, as noted, six days before his final hearing, Mostly everything got changed out. Anything that was in his name as a share got swapped out to Nepi because he had swapped Nepi out, uh, well, put it all in his wife's name and not his. So he swapped out his wife for himself and then uh, that's with Nepi and then with every other shareholding, he's changed that out from Adrian Brennock to Nyepi so that it all comes back to the same place anyway and he also removed himself from directorships at the time but still on the 14th of August and up until the end of August he was the director of Mount Burrow Commercial so in between Adrian Brennock filing the notice to set aside his bankruptcy notice, he moved all these shares around to 
conceal them from his bankruptcy statement of affairs. And as I've stated before, that these act in themselves necessitate giving false information because you actually swear, as you do with any declaration you make, that to the best of your abilities, this is, you know, the truth and everything that you, you know, you've been honest about it. But you see, Adrian Brennock has already signed five non-disclosure agreements that we know of with creditors to do with banks and lending associations and credit cards, car loans. And he has signed non-disclosure agreements to not repeat anything about the settlement. But instead of keeping quiet about it, he got very vocal and it was used as a technique promoted to people trying to escape their debts. And as also pointed out, that if you deliberately make a false statutory declaration stating that there is fraud when there isn't any, when you make a police claim that you think there is fraud, uh, you're actually making false criminal complaints, knowingly. So there's a lot of things that have gone on before Adrian Brannock decided that he was going to control his bankruptcy. He wasn't going to let, you know, the court appoint anyone because he might lose the lot if just anyone did their job because if they did one simple search and found out that he'd moved shares, well, yeah, he'd be in the pup. So he needed to make sure he very carefully selected a friendly trustee, one that was either cooperative or uh, just wasn't that diligent. However, when it comes to the appointment of trustees, there even seems to be a hierarchy in it, in that well, Stephen Starts is presented as the liquidator of Wollumbin Horizons, but he is actually acting under somebody else in his business who is actually recorded as being the person responsible uh, for the liquidation, even though Starts is listed as the official liquidator. He has a boss that is actually responsible for it. And it's the same with uh, Wanazri. He's likewise got a boss that's actually accountable for the overall bankruptcy. So wherever you're looking at a bankruptcy or a liquidator, you are looking at at least sort of like the junior that it's delegated to to handle and the overall boss that supervises it but probably doesn't know too much about what's going on because they're trusting the underling is doing the, the right job. And if the underling presents the information to his boss in the manner that leads him to believe that that's exactly the case, uh, yes. I mean, you don't actually expect your underling to be... Um, Mm, on the take or feeding you the wrong information. I mean, you're paying his wages, you know, he's supposed to be doing the right thing by the company that he works for, not for himself. So at this stage, it's actually difficult to know what level of willing participation or ignorance is involved around the four distinct people that uh, two on Wollumbin Horizons trustee side and two on Adrian Bank, um, Brennock's bankruptcy trustee side. Now it appears that well one out of those four is at least showing that he is a professional and so I'd have to say a very big thanks to him for actually taking all this information and investigating 
the movement of shares because uh, it is not a matter of, um, well, really, you could say it's a matter of the only thing you could argue is that whether he intended to do it or it just happened by mistake and he didn't mean to move those shares, he just forgot about them. That is only, I mean, that can only be the, the kind of excuse he can come up with. I mean, it is very deliberate. He knows he is under service of a bankruptcy notice, as was highlighted in the June order. And he knows what's coming for him. And he also knows what he's going to lose if he doesn't protect it. These are not too hard to um, ascertain. And if you take into consideration the history that he's had, well, let's have a quick look, shall we? So back in 2016, after spending a year in and out of court, even bringing in Mark McMurtry to, you know, come up with some sovereignty bullshit, because this uh, judgment actually relates to uh, the house that Adrian Brennock had with his wife and they tried claiming sovereignty and not paying back any of the money that they borrowed for it. Uh, yeah, this is, as I say, this is all about avoiding paying debts, avoiding paying tax. It's not about sovereignty. It's about finding something that works. So then, yes, about a year later, he's setting up a mortgage to buy 3222, or is it 3222? I'm not really 100% sure on that, because, um, well, it does describe down here that it's all the parcel attached, but there was no necessity. So essentially, um, I'm looking at this as that He's borrowing against what's already been paid as an asset by the investors because uh, it was Adelaide Investments or something like that that they borrowed the money off to finalise the purchase of 3222. So this is over and above it. And actually it might start to make a little bit more sense about using this as collateral to purchase the land parcel of Zimmerland for 4.2. I don't know. It's um, As I say, some things are an evolving... Um, you work with the facts that you have and you formulate what you can on what you're given. So anyway, in 2017, he's, he's taking out a loan for... Uh, um, well, it looks like 1.2. And also through another member company, he and Philip Dixon are organising to get the land off Zimmerland for $4.2 million, which clearly that has never eventuated because in 2019, Zimmerland still owns the land that is claimed as part of the land parcel, along with... Uh, Peter Van Leishout and uh, Dolph Cook and Darko Kovac and also Kemp Cove who is also Peter Van Leishout. So all the land that they talk about as being part of the project actually only comes down to really one page in the Planet PDF. The rest of the Planet PDF are uh, excerpts taken out of the old DA lapsed approval that Peter Van Leishout originally submitted back in, uh, well, it, it had approval till June 2014 and it lapsed and that's it. There's been nothing ever since. But what they've done at Nightcap on Minjimbal is that the whole Planet PDF is basically built with all the excerpts out of the old DA to make it look like this is all part of the plan and everything. And that 
in some stages they state that um, there is pre-existing approval. This is said in 2020 there is pre-existing approval. Now this is contrary to what they actually know as fact. That is false and misleading information. Every attempt they go to put in a DA for approval, they get knocked back. There is not even an application lodged with the council. And they have been told in writing that they will not approve any such development at that address. Now, they couldn't make it any clearer. But as part of the whole thing that goes on with um, a scam is that it is far better to sell something on the promise of something happening and keep selling forward that fulfillment of the promise than to actually turn around and say to people, well, yeah, we have been told a hundred times, you know, but we're still going to try. We're really going to try because, you know, the hurdle that it was last time and they'll make up something that sounds believable so that you'll think, well, yeah, they can overcome that and they'll just keep stringing it out and stringing it out. And the more they can string it out, the more they can get investors to invest and more money that, well, you're going to end up like all the other past lost investors that, well, if the paper works as good as it is now as it was then, uh, we won't even know if you got paid. And the title certificates that they talk about giving out, there were 30 of them presented to the court. And the court made the determination that because there was no legitimately filed trustee registered one, that nobody that had been issued those certificates had been legitimately re registered as receiving those certificates. So you couldn't identify if they were just a piece of paper that someone photocopied from a friend or that they had a legitimate interest in the property. So that's the value of the piece of paper that past investors were given for all those tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars that they forked over. So on the left here, there's the PDF that is the debtor's petition application to become a bankrupt. And as you can see, it's three pages long. It doesn't require uh, too much doing. You know, there's a thing here. And there's lots of, um, you know, like this, have a look here. You've got um, sequestrian orders, fact sheets, consequences of bankruptcy. I mean, there's just an abundance of information out there. So there, and it is also incumbent upon the trustees to actually make sure that the bankrupt clearly understands everything that's going on so that they can't turn around and say, well, I wasn't informed, I didn't know. Now, this is a very, you know, I mean, you notice that they do this in so many places to make people personally responsible that you understand this information. But you see, it doesn't matter whether someone like Adrian Brannock understands the information. It's whether he agrees that you should have the right to impose that on him. And he does not think that people have the right to impose that on him. It's only a title and it means nothing to him. He has said this. So his responsibilities as a bankrupt means nothing to him. And here's a handy dandy little info sheet that I'm sure he read before he put in setting aside a bankruptcy notice. It's 14 pages of it. So he would have scrutinized that to find out where he could have utilized and tried to 
justify his application to set aside the bankruptcy notice. But it is clear that at some stage, Adrian Brennock has chosen where he has filed his information and directed the course so that when it's all presented to the court, he already has someone that has been acting as his trustee. So the court just appoints that trustee on the debtor's petition. Now, on the other hand, with the sequestrian order, you could imagine a scenario of events where um, the person doesn't think that they're going to go bankrupt, they think they're going to win, and they have not been to see an accountant or anybody or set anything up. And when it gets to the stage where the court says, well, no, you're a bankrupt, and they appoint someone for you. Uh, I am not so sure, you know, I don't know every law or anything out there, whether there may be circumstances in which the creditor objects to the appointed trustee and whereby the court will appoint one in, in that objection's place. Well, only if the objection is um, valid and ruled for or a judgment made on it. Because it's like with all meetings and everything, there has to be consent of those representing the party. So, yes, if anyone objects to any part of the process, that actually has to be looked at. That's actually one of those things that they like to use, um, these sovereignty people, all these little tricks to frustrate the courts with all these little things. But uh, yes, he's definitely tried to set aside the notice. Whereas in a sequestrian order, you have got um, the creditors that are driving uh, the courses of the action. I don't know at what stage you might even be able to turn around and say under a sequestrian order, look, I don't like this trustee, can I, can I appoint this one? Uh, as I said, I'm not too sure on that side of it. But I am willing to learn and learning a lot as I go along. And that's just an update on Adrian Brennock and his bankruptcy and what has surrounded it. And the, a few of the events leading up to his going bankrupt, I mean, he's already thrown Wollumbin Horizons into the fire sale. He's already lost his previous house uh, through a sovereignty attempt to claim. But now he lives in some bloody mansion as a bankrupt operating a project that planet value at $36 million. Conducting activities that a bankrupt is not permitted to conduct. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the part about moving shares, concealing from uh, discovery. I mean, there's, there's at least, well, Let's just say that the crimes in the Bankruptcy and Corporations Act overlap into other areas in the criminal codes and acts and expand on other activities that enabled a lot of this criminal activity to go on. Because uh, you cannot look at the company searches or ex the ATSIC extracts of all the member associated companies, the dates of moving shares and directorships around, what they all knew about Adrian Brannock's position and how they helped him to move things around to avoid a detection from his bankruptcy. So it's not just Adrian Brannock that's involved with hiding things in his own bankruptcy. People have aided and abetted him, and that is in the criminal codes, criminal act. Anyway, I'm going to leave it on that today, not turned into a really long one, and I'll catch you next time.